Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Spotlight on Innovation, Attacking High Textbook Costs and Improving Outcomes. Thank you for joining us. In addition to more than 100 attendees today, we've got a very distinguished group of speakers with us. But first, a few brief housekeeping items. You should see on your screen the GoToWebinar interface, including a questions pane. We very much encourage you to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation or at the end. At the end of the presentation, we will pose as many of your questions to our speakers as schedules allow. Also note that to open and close the control panel and access the questions pane, just click on the orange arrow at the top. With that, I'd like to introduce our opening speaker and moderator, Eric Frank, president and founder of Flat World Knowledge, the largest publisher of free and open college textbooks for students worldwide. Eric brings with him 15 years of higher education publishing experience including positions in sales, editorial, and marketing with Thompson, now Cengage, and Prentice Hall Pearson before founding Flat World Knowledge in an effort to bring disruptive innovation to higher education publishing. Eric? Thanks, everybody, and uh, welcome to our webinar today. Um, we are going to start by talking a little bit about the problem and where, where, where we've sort of come from. Um, and uh, then I'll talk about open textbooks briefly. What are they? Uh, so that everybody has a good foundation. And then we'll move to um, Virginia State University, where we'll have Dr. Mirta Martin, um, Dean of the VSU School of Business, and Dr. Andrew Feldstein, assistant professor there, talk about uh, sort of college of business level action, things that they were able to do uh, at a college level to affect uh, affordable textbook prices. We'll then move to. Um, uh, uh, Darlene McCoy and Steve Acker, Acker within the University System of Ohio uh, talking about a number of strategic steps that they have taken and are taking um, towards a statewide affordability solution. And then finally to Dr. Cable Green uh, of the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. We'll talk about really uh, some profound systemic change that, uh, that his system is engaged in right now. We're going to begin by talking about the $200 textbook and uh, how we arrived at this place. I think we, we basically have a profound value gap in the marketplace between students on the one hand who are increasingly wired and savvy um, uh, digitally, but also bring less family income um, to college and work more hours while they're in college than any prior generation. And on the other side of that gap are books that, as you can see, are approaching or have surpassed the $200 mark. If you look at this over time, um, the, the bottom line represents a consumer price index or inflation over a 20-year period. The top line is the rise in tuition and fees, and this is the rise in textbook prices. The data is getting a little old, but directionally it's accurate. In fact, the problem has only become uh, worse. That's a lot of financial pain, obviously, for a student uh, trying to attend higher ed. And that pain is not evenly distributed. If you're at a two-year community college and you're paying X for tuition and fees, you're paying 72% of X for your textbooks, uh, or almost as much for books as you're paying for your entire education. Uh, and it's having a negative impact. Uh, the Gates Foundation recently funded a study. Uh, and when released, they, they spoke to 600 students who had dropped out of college to find out why. And the, num the top two reasons were, uh, as you can see here, the cost of textbooks and other fees besides tuition affected me financially, and I had to work as well, and it was too stressful trying to do both. And so what's happening in the industry is students are responding to those high prices by going online and looking for alternatives to purchasing a new book, which they're finding in increasing numbers every year, whether that's more used books um, by driving uh, to places like Amazon or Craigslist, more global gray market books being re-imported via the internet to the US, more rental options proliferating uh, online uh, and locally at bookstores, and also piracy, uh, which has really uh, become rampant in the past three years in the textbook industry. Uh, and all of that's leading to lower unit sales for publishers. They're selling less books each year. Uh, and as a result, uh, what the publishing industry is doing is raising prices even faster to make up for lost units. And so price increases have gone from 4% a year to 12% a year in the industry and, and are continuing to rise. Uh, and things like uh, coming out with new additions to try to flush the market of all these alternatives uh, faster and therefore be able to generate a return on investment and profit. And all of that's basically making the problem worse, I think, for all of the constituents in the market, students who are angry, faculty who feel like unwilling participants in a broken market, and authors who are writing twice as fast and earning less income every year um, because of the loss of, of unit sales. 
And so one solution emerging on the market is open textbooks. And so to set a foundation of what, what an open textbook really is, it's, it's a license issue. Um, we live in a world of, of uh, copyrighted materials, and openly licensed textbooks are copyrighted like all others. But historically, the, the um, books were published, copyrighted books were published under an all rights reserved license. It reserves all the rights to the holder of copyright, meaning the user has only what's, what's available under fair use provisions. An openly licensed book is a book that's been published, it's copyrighted, but it's under an open license, deleting uh, a family of licenses, Creative Commons. And it's really about some rights are reserved to the copyright holder, and a lot more rights are transferred to the user. And I think of those, those rights as the five R's of open. Um, the right to legally make copies and reuse that material. Uh, the right to revise and to remix, meaning to, take, to actually change the, the material uh, to better suit one's own course and one's own curriculum. Um, the right to redistribute um, the book, whether it's been modified or not, legally redistribute it. And the right for students to access a free version of that textbook somewhere. Um, those are obviously profoundly different rights than uh, the industry has historically afforded to customers. Um, so where do open textbooks come from? Uh, they come from individuals, uh, just people sort of frustrated and fed up with uh, the state of the industry and who are saying, I want to make my materials uh, available in a much more open way. Um, and uh, they just post them online, apply an open license, and, and you have the beginning of a movement. Uh, that sort of gave rise to aggregators, platforms like Connections at Rice University or Merlot at Cal State, um, who said, we'll aggregate, we'll pl provide a place for people to upload their open textbooks and materials, uh, we'll allow them to find them, search them, mix them together, connect them to a print-on-demand back end in many cases, and access them in a more efficient way for teaching. And, and that we've also seen the arrival of, of models like the uh, company that I co-founded, Flat World Knowledge, which are really publishers. Um, we're like a McGraw-Hill in that we do all of what a publisher does, uh, except that we then turn around and take the resulting textbook and license it openly so that users have a lot more control. So I'm going to spend uh, a couple of minutes um, walking through what that model looks like so you can really get a feel for what's possible. And then you'll hear how it's being implemented systemically uh, by our three uh, different groups of innovators on the call. Uh, our model basically is you, you just continue to publish great textbooks, continue to seek out selectively the top authors and scholars in their particular field, have them write an exclusive textbook um, for Flat World, professionally develop it, meaning um, professionally illustrate it, design it, etc., uh, extensively peer review the work, and then support it with the uh, availability of instructor supplements and desk copies for instructors. In that regard, it's about getting on the playing field. Um, then we openly license the material. Uh, and so what I mean there is uh, we publish the material under a Creative Commons open license, therefore transferring those five rights. And we provide a technology platform to allow individuals or, or uh, curriculum managers to actually customize material. So this is just an example of taking a book like a psychology book and saying, I want to customize it, uh, and then entering an editor where you can rearrange content, edit content, and insert content into the book. And it's really as easy as clicking, dragging, and typing. So you can click and hold sections or chapters and put them in a new place. You can delete things with the click of a trash can that you don't want to cover. And if I wanted to edit something like section 10.1, the experience of emotion, I can simply click on it, load it up in the editor, and begin editing anything. I can insert materials into the textbook in between paragraphs. Uh, I can click on any existing material and open it up inside of a web editor where I can delete, add, cut and paste into here, put links out to the internet, uh, and really turn this book into something that, that fits my own course. And I can even add new content quite easily. So if I wanted to create a new section in this chapter on emotions, uh, I could click make a new section, type in a title, save it. I've now created a new section which I can drop anywhere in that chapter. And I can build it quite simply by inserting some new things. So I could start by putting in some learning objectives and saving them, uh, putting in a paragraph of content, saving it. Uh, I can even integrate multimedia. So if I wanted to, uh, here I refer to a video. Uh, I could go and say I want to insert a video clip and go out to put in the YouTube URL, give it a title and a description and a citation, go ahead and save it. And finally, I could wrap up by adding some exercises about the video, for example. 
and saving that. And in no time, I've created a very interesting uh, new uh, section that talks about something going on in the Middle East right now to motivate students' understanding of the, the subject. And when I click Save, it instantly formats like the rest of the textbook so that it looks like a seamless experience uh, from a student's perspective and this material is part of the book. When I go ahead and click Publish, this is where we begin to get to the student savings. That book, with all those changes, or not, if, if you just uh, someone adopted the off-the-shelf book, is available to the students for free. So anybody in the world today can go to the catalog of books or go to Connections or Merlot and read uh, those textbooks online entirely for free. Uh, we also produce Section 508 compliant versions. Um, so for students with print disabilities, we produce digital Braille and daisy readable versions. And those are also available freely um, to students. The way we make money, and we are a for-profit company, although others like Merlot and Connections and other um, uh, platforms are not, is we offer students choices around free. So we offer soft cover books in black and white or color from bookstores or directly online. We offer audio books by the book or by the chapter, downloadable PDF files um, by the book or by the chapter, downloadable e-reader books, downloadable iPhone books, and of course the free web book. And we also sell a range of study aids that students can opt to purchase by the book or by the chapter. So the student message basically is your professor chose the book, you get to choose the format and price, and you can see here that 44% read for free, uh, that's their uh, uh, preferred experience, and then the other 56% um, end up buying a format of the textbook uh, across these different format distributions you see here. Uh, we estimate that based on $100 per student average transaction with a traditional textbook in use, uh, in our model it's an average of $20 per student when you take free and paid, and so the savings are $80 per student. And so I'll conclude with whether or not this is sustainable. Um, and today we have 112 top uh, authors under contract. Uh, the vast majority of them are successful textbook authors with other publishers uh, moving over to publish their next textbook under an open model. Since we first published a book in March 2009, we've had 2,100 uh, adoptions, uh, formal adoptions across the country and, and around the world. And we've got 115,000 student users. Um, we've recently seen a lot of interest from, from the mainstream uh, publishing world. So Bertelsmann, uh, the largest media company in the world, uh, had recently led a Series B uh, investment in flat world knowledge. Uh, and just this week, we announced that Random House invested in flat world knowledge. So lots of, I think, um, indications that there's a new front opening up, a new model opening up in the textbook publishing world. And I think the media is basically perceiving this as uh, potentially uh, a big sea change in the way that uh, textbooks are distributed and priced. Uh, Outsell, which is a media industry analyst group, recently named Flat World along with Apple, Facebook, Google, Thomson Reuters uh, as one of the information industries 30 to watch in 2011. I'm going to um, conclude by uh, talking about institutions for one minute and then turning this over. Um, Basically, you know, it's clear that individuals have the power to change this market uh, from what I've talked about. Individual authors have the power to uh, choose to publish their textbooks uh, under an open license. Individual professors can choose and are choosing uh, to adopt them. And then students can choose uh, how they want to or if they want to spend their money on textbook materials. Um, but I think what's really interesting is the role of institutions in all of this. Institutions are beginning to recognize that there's an opportunity for them uh, to leverage what they bring to the table to drive cost down and quality up. And so uh, as a foundational thing, this is our, our model I just described. In an institutional model, uh, we're actually selling seat licenses to institutions where uh, each student enrolled in a course has access to all digital formats, all study aids, and, and, and lower priced discounted print options. Uh, and the institution generally is embedding the cost of that uh, in tuition and fees for students and therefore driving costs down to $20 and well below that per student. Um, so what we're going to do now is walk through sort of the, the, the role of institutions uh, that are stepping up and playing a role here. Uh, from, again, Virginia State uh, acting at the college level to the University System of Ohio, acting at a system level uh, to the state of Washington, acting also at a system level but with some strong uh, legislative support and background. And so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dr. Mirta Martin, 
uh, and to Dr. Andrew Feldstein. Um, just to give you a little bit more background, Dr. Martin is the Dean of the Reginald Lewis School of Business at Virginia State. Uh, she's excelled in both the public sector and private sectors, serving as a senior banking executive as well as a leader in higher education, including positions as a tenured professor, an interim dean at Averitt University, associate dean at the University of Richmond's Robbins School of Business, executive VP and executive director of the John Tyler Community College Foundation, and as a special assistant to the chancellor of the Virginia Community College System. Dr. Andrew Feldstein is an assistant professor of marketing at Virginia State, where he's led the curriculum task force for the School of Business in the development of a new integrated curriculum and innovative model for delivering open textbooks and digital resources. He's also leading the effort to build an online social learning community for the School of Business, building on his research interests and extensive business background in retailing. And so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Martin and Dr. Feldstein. Thank you so very much. Um, and thank you all for joining us. I think that um, these are wonderful and uh, exciting times for us. And I was just talking to someone else about Eric and describing our partnership as much more than a partnership, but really a family um, uh, member. Um, just a little bit of back, uh, background as to how we came together and why we started down this path. I arrived at the university about 16 months ago and quickly became aware of the fact that the curriculum needed to be revamped. Uh, and amidst that uh, expectation was the realization that our students were failing at inordinate numbers. We went ahead and uh, commissioned a, a study and looked at three semesters worth of ad adoption of purchase of our textbooks and found out that about only 47% of our students were able to purchase textbooks. We are primarily a first generation school and um, as a result most of our students, 92 percent of them working excess of 40 hours a week to be able to make ends meet. Uh, oftentimes our students are faced with a dilemma not unlike an elderly person of having to make two choices and in our students cases it's uh, do I send money home, do I send money home to um, a family member, do I put food on my table or do I purchase a textbook? And oftentimes what ended up happening was that the um, former versus the latter uh, what was what uh, was coming to pass and our students kept feeling that if they showed up to class maybe they could pass the course and they would model along until uh, midterms came and then of course the floodgates would become open because they were not able to pass the midterm exams and um, would fail out of the course. So in revamping the curriculum and ensuring that it met with industry standards, we also then knew that we needed to do something other than just continue down the path of using traditional textbooks. And that's when uh, Dr. Felstein came into uh, play with his research background and interest. We started to go down the path of trying to figure out to deliver our knowledge in something other than the traditional textbook, something in additional fashion. Uh, Dr. Felstein, and I refer to him as the digital czar, um, interviewed just about every single publishing company that there is to be interviewed. And um, understanding where, where I wanted to go and understanding where he wanted to go, he would prep them up to a point and then I would come in and invariably I would come in and, and, and Andrew would say, well, yeah, I think they're, you know, they're prime. I think they understand it. And I'd come in, I'd start talking to them, and then the companies would glaze over. Um, they just didn't understand what it was that we needed. So we would come back um, the, until we met Eric and until we, we became involved with Flat World. He got it. He understood it. He understood that we needed to go to the next level. I often tell the story as to really what precipitated in addition to doing the research. I, uh, I'm an external dean. I walked the halls and I got about 1,467 students and I opened, I have an open door policy and one day I had a young man came to my office, um, rather small young man, only about 275 pounds and about 6'3" and literally started crying. And I said, you know, what's wrong? What are the faculty not doing? What resources do we need to do? Because he said, Dr. Martin, I just can't flunk this course. I'm taking it for the fourth time. 
And um, in digging, found out that even though it was the fourth time, he had not been able to purchase the textbook uh, any of the previous times, nor this time. Um, so that was what precipitated really and truly the, the push to go somewhere other than, than just a traditional textbook. Um, we launched the digital partnership with Eric in the fall of this year. We moved heaven and earth um, because the faculty had to be approve a brand new curriculum. We had to get together with Eric and Eric had to go ahead and provide us with the textbooks. We did that within, in six months, got everything passed through the university uh, curriculum committees and all of the other committees, and we launched our new integrated curriculum uh, delivered digitally through a pilot of nine courses this fall, um, 11 months after my arrival here at Virginia State. After a semester, uh, most of our data is in. Uh, we have double-digit retention rates in the uh, textbooks, excuse me, in the courses that we piloted, and we saved our students over $67,000. Uh, we plan to take this uh, partnership up to the next level. We will be um, launching the open source textbooks in 15 courses next semester, and the only thing that's very honestly keeping us from launching it to 100% of our curriculum is Eric himself, who I keep knocking at his door and saying, I need more textbooks, I need more textbooks. Um, but because this is an innovative approach and because we're just starting, it does take a little bit of time to get there, and we understand it. But um, you know, I can't emphasize enough how great working with Flatworld has been. Um, they, they are really far more than just a partner. They are a family member. Um, when we launched this, they came to us and they said, because you're our trial and we want to be part of the family, we're going to go ahead and put our money where our mouth is and gave us a deal that we could not refuse and made it very easy for us to embrace it because, very honestly, this year we paid out of pocket for the licensing fee, we mean in the School of Business. Uh, as we enter the second year of operations, we're exploring models to pass the cost on to our students. But the first year it came out of my pocket, and given that the Commonwealth of Virginia has experienced double-digit budget reductions over the past five years, uh, that has not been an easy task for us, but we felt it was the right thing to do. And now, after we have uh, had such success, I know it was the right thing to do. So. Um, having said that, I'll pass it on to my partner in crime, the digital czar, Dr. Felstein. So uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, adoption, uh, both from the faculty level and the student level. And one of the interesting things about this process was getting everyone to understand understand, even when we came down to uh, creating this deal with Flat World, the media talked about it as if Virginia State University is adopting ebooks. And our faculty was talking about the fact that they were now using ebooks, and our students were talking about ebooks. Um, ebooks are only a very small part of what this license meant for us. Um, Eric talked earlier about the, the four R's, and in this, five was it five R's, I think? In this particular case, um, the issue of accessibility is key because it's not just about being able to read the textbooks online. It's about students being able to access their content through a myriad of sources, including um, all the devices that are on the slide that you're, you're seeing there. I, we have students that prefer to read the content on their Blackberries, on their iPhones, on their iPods, on their, on their laptops, any number of ways. Um, and more students are reporting that they're reading the material and that they're getting more out of the material. And this is terrific. You know, we can have a very high number of students registering the materials. First semester we had about 85% of the students in each class register for the materials. This semester we had about 96% of the students registering for the materials. Uh, but just registering for the materials obviously is only a very small first step. 
they needed to be able to take advantage of all those materials. And the slide that you see now talks a little bit about how the students have taken to the flat world content. And as the faculty understand that they can be more a number of ways, um, the students are now understanding that it's not just about going online and reading the material, which last semester 91% of them reported. In the slide that you're looking at, um, what we have are the, are the four basic formats, digital download formats that the students have for their flat world material. There are either PDF files for individual chapters, there are Mobi files through which they can read their uh, textbooks through a Kindle or a Kindle app, EPUB files so they can read them on iBooks or other e-readers, and MP3 files for the books that also have audio files available to them. This is a snapshot of the number of downloads. Uh, Left-hand column was fall 2010 at midterm, which was the, sem the first semester that we were with Flat World Books. And the next column is midterm spring 11, which was just a couple of weeks ago. And as you can see, there's some fairly dramatic increases in adoption. I'm particularly happy to see the, the very large increases in the Mobi files and in the EPUB files, which means that more and more students are actually viewing their textbook as a totality um, on an e-reader or on their computer, which is terrific. Uh, we're still getting increases on the PDF files, but I think students are beginning to realize more and more that the, the versatility in the Mobi and the EPUB files is terrific. And so um, things are moving very well, and the students are really positive about it. And um, we're going to move forward as quickly as we can. That's uh, great. Thank you um, uh, very much, uh, Dr. Martin and Dr. Feldstein. Um, I am now going to uh, turn things over to um, uh, two distinguished speakers, uh, Darlene McCoy, Associate Vice Chancellor, and uh, Dr. Acker. Um, Darlene McCoy is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Affordability and Efficiency at the University System of Ohio, um, where she's responsible for driving elements of Ohio's 10-year strategic plan for higher education aimed at improving affordability and access to higher education. Darlene has a distinguished career in public service, including past positions as Director of the Ohio Civil Rights Commission and Chief of Staff for former Mayor Michael White of Cleveland as well as serving as a partner of the law firm Calfee, Halter, and Griswold LLP. Dr. Steve Acker serves as the director of the Ohio Digital Bookshelf, a collaborative project of OhioLINK, the State Library Consortium, and the University System of Ohio. The project focuses on the strategic use of digital learning materials to reduce student costs and improve learning outcomes. Dr. Acker is Emeritus Professor at The Ohio State University, where, in addition to his teaching, he served as the Founding Director of Technology Enhanced Learning and Research and Director of Learning Technologies Research and Innovation. And with that, I will turn it over to both of you. Steve, can you hear me? We lost our video. We lost First our slide. video. Uh, Steve, I, okay, I think we're back now. Can you, uh, are you able to see the uh, video? No. Uh, okay, let me... Um, While you're trying to fix that, I will give the overview of Ohio. Great. And in Ohio, um, we have, like at any state, a need we're to... We're back here. Okay. We want to have uh, anybody who can afford to go to college to be able to do so. And one of the fundamental pieces of that is the affordable textbook. So we have been focusing um, for the last year or so in trying to make sure that we can meet the need of faculty and students through the promotion of open educational resources and digital technology. If you look at this slide, there's a six-year trend in the growth of what uh, student, uh, the number of students that are coming to colleges in Ohio. And if this slide right here shows the headcount change by sector. Now, as you can see, we're uh, seeing many more students 
wanting to go to regional campuses and community colleges, not just for the cost factor, because a lot of people are re-entering the workforce. So we actually do have a new traditional student between the ages of 25 and 36 that are attending, uh, attending college at, at mid-career. We also have students that are uh, really technologically savvy from the day they're born. And so therefore, we have to make sure that we can provide them the options that allow them to learn or improve their learning outcomes with a digital or open educational uh, textbook. Steve? So that brings us to the Ohio Digital Bookshelf. And the theme for this presentation is collaboration is the highest form of competition. So I thought we should start right here. What you're looking at here are 24 of the 46 colleges and universities in the University System of Ohio. The red underlines represent participants, 24 of the 48 schools. And they all took their introduction, introductory psychology textbook that typically came from Bedford, Freeman, and Worth, Cengage, McGraw-Hill, John Wiley, and Worth, as well as Flatware Knowledge most recently, and agreed to offer a digital version to their students. The, the, one of the benefits from their perspective was that our publishing partners agreed to a 70% off discount on the digital version. Some of our schools realized over $60,000 of saving in the one quarter alone. Our second collaborative strategy involved building something called the Ohio Digital Bookshelf Ning. And you can see four ways in which social organizations connect. This is from Chitrox and Fowler, who are two researchers interested in ways to bring about innovation. Many of us are organized in unconnected groups where we randomly bump into people that might have a shared and common interest. Our goal is to move the interest in affordable textbooks and learning outcomes into something closer to the military squad down here in which these tightly coupled networks exchange information that can allow others to adopt new ways of doing things. Each one of these clusters in our model represents one of the 20 dis disciplines that enroll the largest number of students. So where we started with psychology, in this quarter we're adding biology, economics, and accounting. And as I said, our goal is ultimately to interconnect all disciplines that share this interest. And through workshops and collaborations to extend the model throughout the state. This is the project that got us going with, with flat world knowledge. We called up Virginia State. We heard the wonderful things about the pilot that they had begun. And we thought we should follow up and gather our own data that we could use to corroborate Virginia State's early research. So we'll be sharing, and thank you, Virginia State, some of the instruments that you've used to collect our own data across 1,000 seats in a variety of colleges and universities in Ohio. Flat World already has added some red links to our um, gray background, including Bowling Green State University and Sinclair Community College. We'll be distributing these textbooks. We'll be collecting information in terms of learning outcomes for the course, in terms of retention and persistence among our students again, following the work that was done at Virginia State University. This work begins in summer and carries through the fall. Another critical area of collaboration we call the Ohio Scaffold to the Stars. And we're honored and fortunate enough to be one of the 29 projects selected by Educause's Next Generation Learning Challenge project. And ours involves building an academic cross in math and applied sciences. In essence, we've taken open educational resources, are modularizing that content, and building a vertical tree in terms of the competencies associated with developmental and credit-bearing math. Across the top are a series of applied environments in statics and other applied sciences, so that when a student in either of those areas runs into a math problem that they, have, they lack an answer to, they can drop down into the vertical of the academic cross and address that particular issue. 
the collaborators in this project, it's, uh, the, the principal investigators, Ohio Link, Edison Community College, Lakeland Community College, Lorain County Community College, Sinclair Community College, Southern State Community College, the Ohio Board of Regents, and Ohio Learning Network are all working together to bring about um, this particular project. And one of the things that we're happiest and proudest about is that our lead authors come from our Ohio colleges and universities. Another area that's critical is a different definition of access, and that's accessibility in the context of uni universal design for learning. We're in our second year of the Accessible Digital Right Management Conference. Uh, the, the second occurs on the 3rd of May in just a couple weeks, actually. And the purpose is to evaluate and promote the born digital content so that when a student who is print disabled, who has a need for an accessible version, can step into a class, even if they haven't declared their condition to disability services, on day one and begin learning along with all their uh, fellow students. It's, it's wonderful that Flat World Knowledge is committed to accessibility from the get-go, and we're bringing a variety of other partners who, who share this interest and enthusiasm. And this group is headed by Rehabilitation Services Commission, which is our state agency associated with students with print disabilities. This is a slight departure, but I think it helps focus through an analogy what we're trying to do with digital textbooks. I don't know how many of you reach back to 1963 when Bob Dylan wrote a song called Who Killed Davy Moore? It's the story of an Ohio boy from Springfield, Ohio, who was a professional fighter. And in 1963, he was in a title fight, and he was knocked out and never regained consciousness. He, he died in the ring. And the, and the book, or I'm sorry, the song tells the disallowance of all the individuals involved in the process. The referee, don't point your finger at me. The angry crowd, the manager, the gambling man with the ticket stub still in his hand, the boxing writer pounding on his old typewriter, the man whose fist laid him low in a cloud of mist. The point is that each of these roles disallowed the responsibility because they relied on the structure of the boxing industry to describe what they do. And the subtitle agency or structure reflects the work of Anthony Giddens, uh, an English sociologist. And he essentially says that um, each of us has the opportunity to apply our will, efforts, and energies to bring about change, but we're either restricted or helped by that structure in which we operate. And in turn, that structure encourages or suppresses the agency or individual activities of those in the system. And we think that that's exactly the case for affordable textbooks and improved learning outcomes. So our goal is to take these six roles uh, who, that mirror those in the, the boxing industry, if you will. We think that the bookstore, the faculty, the librarian, publishers of all stripes, the state agency, and our legislators, and the students bring a necessary agency to try and bring about this change in the structure of the textbook industry. And each of these are our collaborators for the upcoming April 26 Ohio Digital Bookshelf Strategic Summit. The summit, as I said, involves these six roles. And the way it's structured is a representative from each of these, including Black World Knowledge, will answer this question. Five years from now, what will the market for learning materials be like? What strategic proposals will drive your contribution to that market? And how can we work together for the costs and learning benefits of our students. Each of these representatives comes up with three to five um, strategic policy thoughts that are added to the work that we've been doing over the last year. I'm trying to uh, advance the slide, but it's not moving. These are the 13, the baker's dozen of strategic summit ideas that we've had. There'll be a archive of this made available to those who choose to visit it. If you would, take the survey and tell us which of these 
15 ideas make sense to you and expect that we'll be adding another 20 or 24 to this list based on the uh, input from those of us attending the strategic summit. So the homework, because this is a, an opportunity to share some time with you and, and these things can be done on your own. If you get a chance, go listen to that song, Who Killed Davy Moore? And differentiate it from the other classic Dylan song, The Times They Are Changing, in which the assumption is we're caught up in this milieu that will bring about the, the goals and things that we're trying to reach. The first song, I think, is a more direct response in terms of our own sets of responsibilities. Go to our initial Ohio Digital Bookshelf strategy proposals, tell us what you think about them, and add your own. And if you're in the neighborhood, on the 19th of April, go up to Bowling Green State University and see the face behind the, the voice of Eric Frank. He'll be doing a live presentation on the campus of Bowling Green. And Jeff Nelson would be able to help you if that's something that would interest you. Please get in touch with any of us if you'd like to learn more. And um, thank you for your attendance. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Darlene and Steve. I'm not sure seeing the face behind the voice is going to be a, uh, uh, necessarily a positive contribution to the movement. But uh, <laughs> you look like one of those sick people. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so with that, we'll bring up um, uh, Dr. Cable Green uh, from the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. Uh, um, Cable is the director of e-learning and open education for the board. Um, uh, Dr. Green mixes technology, open licensing, and open policy to significantly improve access to quality, affordable, digital educational materials to the world. His team is building and sharing their entire general education curriculum with the world under a, a CC BY or Creative Commons attribution only license. They call it the Open Course Library. Cable believes publicly funded educational materials should be freely and openly available to the public that paid for it. With that, I will turn it over to you, Cable. Thanks, Eric. Can you hear me okay? We can. So I'm, I'm looking at the slide here, and I'm trying to figure out why I chose that picture. And I think it's either because it's over a national park in the middle of Alaska, and so there's some theme there about uh, the times they are changing and lots of opportunity, uh, or it's I'm in uh, an experimental aircraft uh, holding on for my dear life because my uncle was flying and we were circling lower to see caribou, and I was a little bit afraid of the new environment that was around me. So uh, I, either way, I suppose it's an appropriate picture for today's conversation. So I, I don't have any slides. I'm just going to talk for a little bit, and I hope that there's some time for, for Q&A later. <coughs> um, just trying to think how to start, and I guess... Um, Steve's two songs were really what were in my head. And that led me to a quote from Victor Hugo, the great French poet. Um, he said, and I, I, I don't speak French well enough to say it in French, but he said, one resists the invasion of armies, one does not resist the invasion of ideas. And that's oftentimes translated to, there is nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. And so let me start with what I think the big idea whose time has come. Um, given certain structures, back to Steve's uh, structure agency analysis, given certain structures, the Internet, mobile devices proliferating, uh, Creative Commons um, licensing, uh, OERs that enable the five R's that Eric talked about, progressive public policy, and our collective will to help others and be willing to share uh, when the marginal costs of doing so are close to zero when you're dealing with digital things. Uh, we can, and I would argue that we have an ethical, fiscal, and moral responsibility to make high-quality educational educational opportunities affordable and accessible to anyone in the world who wants to engage. And, and I believe that given the new structural components that surround us, uh, we in fact do have new agency options that didn't exist before. And I think all we have to do is look around at the new educational entities that are, that are popping up from flat world knowledge to straighter line to university of the people to peer-to-peer -peer university, OERU, 
Um, there's all these do-it-yourself uh, educational options which are rough around the edges. They're just getting started. They're not accredited yet. But what they're doing is they're looking at the new structure and asking um, what, what can we do and, in fact, what should we do given the new uh, environment that, that we're in. The best example uh, to drive this point home that I've heard is uh, from Wayne McIntosh in New Zealand. Wayne is um, helping to set up the OER University. He, he says this. He says, if we had a, a food machine, and this food machine cost almost nothing to run, and it had the capability to feed everybody in the world who was hungry, and the marginal costs of running this food machine were close to zero, should we do it? And I think uh, you talk to almost anybody, doesn't matter what their political preferences are, um, they would say, well, of course, we, uh, it, would, it would be uh, unethical not to operate this food machine and, and share it. And I believe fundamentally it's, it's a very similar question with the opportunities that we have around open educational resources and open licensing uh, because, in fact, the marginal costs are close to zero uh, to share. And I'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Um, all, all that said, as an intro, I uh, threw this by my mentor, uh, Tom McCain, uh, from Ohio State University, good friend of Steve Ackers, and I said, so Tom, here's my opening, what do you think? And he said, well, uh, don't forget my favorite quote of the day, and that is, for every complex problem, there was an answer that is simple, neat, and wrong. Um, and while I uh, am uh, significantly more optimistic than that, um, he is correct in that these issues are complex and they require uh, uh, thought and significant amount of collaboration and sitting down with all parties who will be affected. Um, and oftentimes uh, these big conversations will affect folks who you've not thought of. So I, I think the reason I was asked to come and speak today was what we are doing uh, to do exactly that, to address this complex environment um, from from different angles at a system level. So, um, so really we've done three things so far. The first one is that we uh, put in place about four years ago a new strategic technology plan. And while it was fundamentally about being more efficient and sharing technologies and not doing things 34 ways just because we have 34 colleges and a half million students, but to do things once and, and have one set of contracts and to integrate once, et cetera. In that document, we also said, uh, by the way, we also need to engage in sharing our digital content, not only with each other, but with the rest of the world. And we, in turn, need to reach out and uh, be humble, up, humble enough to take from others when what they have to share is high quality and backed by data, et cetera. So that was step one. We have carried that policy um, strategy forward, not just in our strategic technology plan, but in our recent mission study, which was an analysis of what should our system do to transfer, uh, translate itself into institutions that will be effective in the 21st century? And then most recently in our efficiency study, which is our legislature saying, given these bad budget times, how are you going to be more efficient within existing resources? In all of those strategic documents and many others, we weave in this concept of open educational resources. So um, that's, that's first word of advice is get it in your docs because it, you'll be able to lean back on them uh, when discussions get tough and times get tough. Second up was we said, well, we want to have a significant project. And Eric mentioned our open course library. If you'd like to see what that is, um, you go to opencourselibrary.org and you'll find it online. Um, so what we said was fundamentally what we need is a, a large project where uh, many of these stakeholders who are interested in these conversations can be involved not only in uh, producing, using others' educational materials, producing new open educational materials, um, but most importantly, moving through that cultural shift, uh, and I'm going to steal a quote from my friend Steve Acker, moving from not invented here to proudly borrowed from there. And uh, as simple as that is to say, um, it's not always a, a simple cultural shift, simply because of the way that we've done things uh, for so long. The structure has incented us not to share for too long. Um, and now, the, because of the, the technologies and the licensing and, and the willingness of so many to share, the rules and the structure have changed. Uh, the Open Course Library is interested for this conversation for many reasons, but the one that I'll point out <clears throat> is that we have a requirement that no textbooks or other required instructional materials can cost more than $30 in the course. 
Uh, as Eric said, all of these courses will be openly licensed. We will respect the licenses of the materials that we're using from others. Um, that may be more restrictive than CC BY, but everything that we produce will have a Creative Commons attribution license on it. We will share these out in the Connections repository and possibly other sites as well. I can see in the participant list that there are several open course library uh, designers, the faculty that are designing these courses are here. Um, and a, a shout out to them. They are the reason why this is, uh, this is and will be a successful project. Um, these folks are heroes in my mind. They're receiving a very small amount of money for some release time uh, to engage in this project. And every single one of them is going over and above uh, the call of duty to, to contribute their time and produce great educational materials that they will then uh, give away at no cost to anybody who wants to use them because fundamentally they believe in these same principles as well. You might ask, how did you pay for this? Uh, where did you get the money? Uh, this was a, a Gates Foundation grant that we received and had a matching grant from our Washington State Legislature. So we've got our legislature involved in all of these conversations. That was number two. Third thing we did was we launched an open policy this, this uh, summer as a system. And we said that all competitive monies that move through the state board in terms of competitive grants will require a CC BY license. Very similar to what the Department of Labor just did with their $2 billion grant where there's a CC BY license required, uh, same thing goes with us. Um, if you don't like those terms, you don't apply for a grant. So the uh, n another interesting thing that we've done is how we think about sustainability. So oftentimes when folks talk about open resources, they say, well, that's a nice fringe uh, project or that's something that's over there on the side and it's not uh, core to what we do. So how will you fund it? How will you sustain it? And our answer is very simple. Uh, our sustainability plan uh, can be summed up in two words. We are going to be selfish. And what we mean by that is we are only going to do what we would do for Washington community and technical colleges anyway, because those are our core activities. That's what we would fund regardless uh, of what the budget situation is. Uh, but we will also put a CC BY license uh, on our work and share it because good things happen to us when we do. And the best example I can give, very short story, our, one of our uh, faculty members in the Open Course Library, Sarah Julin is her name. She's at Whatcom Community College. She's designing an engineering physics course. She contacted engineering faculty at MIT because uh, they were giving away their engineering physics curriculum online through MIT Open Courseware merely to say thank you and wanted to let you know I'm using your materials. The end result was a trip out to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts for an entire week where she's now on an international team that's uh, designing that very same course uh, and she's in an international project uh, with MIT faculty and folks from other countries as well uh, because she reached out and because others were willing to share with her. So, so just to sum up, uh, wh where does this take us and um, I'm a policy wonk in a state agency. What should we do from a policy standpoint? Um, I believe that uh, we can take advantage of this new structure and exercise our new agency if we are able to focus on what matters. And in our discussions, our strategic discussions, we say only one thing matters, and that is to increase student success and access to quality educational um, opportunities, including educational materials. And then to go a step further with a policy, the policy goes something like this. Efficient use of public funds to increase student success and access to quality educational materials uh, is what we should be focusing on. And, and everything else, and this is important, everything else, including all existing business models, are secondary to that goal. So why is that important? Because somebody will tell you why you cannot operate in this new structure with the new agency that you're seeking to exercise. And your answer should always come back to what the core principles are. And you'll find them in your mission of your institution. You'll find them in the mission of your departments. And it will be about student learning. It will be about student completion. It will be about student success and other key metrics that actually matter that we're all in the business to do. And so I believe that we need to move toward setting the default to open, that K-20 educational institutions make open licensing on all publicly funded content the default rather than the exception. Uh, taxpayer resources should be open educational resources. If you walk up to somebody on the street and you say, your tax dollars are being used to produce that course over there or that textbook over there, do you think you should have access? I, I think most people would say yes. 
A few slogans, if you're looking for slogans to go with this, you should get what you pay for. Uh, it uh, uh, works. Uh, public access to publicly funded educational materials. And my favorite from my friend David Wiley is, if you buy one, you should get one. So I think that on textbooks, just to sum it up, we should move to a new model. In this country, we spend roughly $20 billion a year on K-20 textbooks annually. Uh, and as Eric pointed out, the value proposition is not in our favor. I think that instead what we should move to are states uh, or the federal government launching RFPs where we put out significant chunks of money, maybe a million dollars per, uh, to have textbooks produced. Anybody can reply to those RFPs, uh, but the publishers do not own the copyright to those books. They're work for hire. And the state of Washington owns the copyright of the state of California or the U.S. federal government. And then what we choose to do, because we were funded with public funds, is we choose to put a Creative Commons attribution license on those materials, and we share with one another, because like it or not, we all have the same highest enrolled courses in higher education, and we all have essentially the same curriculum in K-12. And when something is openly licensed, it can very quickly and easily be revised and remixed to meet local needs. So I think that's the opportunity in front of us. Um, there's, those are a few notes about what we're doing in the state of Washington. And if anybody else um, shares that same passion to exercise our new agency, as Steve has pointed out, give me a call. I'd sure like to work with you. Back to you, Eric. That's great. Uh, thank you so much, Cable, and uh, to all the speakers for, for um, your contributions, but probably more importantly, um, the actions and, and the steps that you've already taken to, uh, to exercise your, your agency. Um, so with that, uh, I think we, as we set this webinar up, we let people know that we would go somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 50 minutes, uh, it would officially conclude at 4.30, but we are, uh, I think, more than willing to stay on uh, and answer any questions people may have. So as you need to drop out, uh, of course, please feel free to do so, and we thank you for your time. Uh, you'll get an email tomorrow uh, with a link to a recorded version of this webinar, um, so you can access that and pass it around to others you think may be interested. Uh, and for those of you who wish to stay on and engage in a little bit of uh, conversation, uh, please feel free to do that as well. And so with that, uh, I'll turn it over to you, Kelly, to moderate some Q&A. Sure. And just a reminder, um, if you would like to submit a question, you can use the questions panel. If it is closed on your screen, go ahead and click the orange arrow on the grab tab, and you can submit. Uh, that will open up the panel, and then you can submit any questions. Um, we'll try and get as many questions as, as we can. Um, I'm going to summarize a couple of them. We've had a number of questions already submitted, and I'd like to focus in on one, which I think is a very good one. There were a couple of questions that talked about the institutional model and what can I do as an individual. And I I think that I sensed in some of those questions perhaps a little bit of confusion about, about how would I proceed on this if I want to do, do something systemically at my organization versus what can I do simply, what can I do quickly, what can I do at my own level if I'm a faculty member or somebody involved at, at a smaller level. So how can I sm sort of uh, start small uh, but go larger? And I guess I'll address that one first to Eric but then if anybody wants to pick up that discussion from there. Yeah, I'll let anybody, anybody want to jump in on that one? Um, while well, you're all thinking about whether you want to jump in or not. I guess I would say, and I certainly think individual faculty have um, uh, in the unique, sit in the unique position of having the market power today to exercise change. So um, it's, it's not a small thing for an individual faculty member to say, I'm going to seek out and utilize uh, and adopt an open textbook in lieu of a traditional uh, all rights reserved textbook should one be available. Um, I think that that uh, single act saves uh, real dollars for real students in those classes, but also, in our experience, creates a, a, a real um, uh, a potential beach uh, front at, at that institution. We've seen uh, for each adoption that we get at a school that that turns into 1.3 adoptions. The next semester turns into 1.8 adoptions uh, and continues to grow. And I think that um, you know peer-to-peer um, success stories are, are in, in many ways going to be the biggest driver of change sort of from the bottom up, if you will. Uh, I think sure. that's critical. I, I'd leave it to others to, to perhaps talk about if you're looking at this sort of from an administrative point of view, what's a small first step you could take to, to answer that question? Eric? Well, Eric, yeah, in go Ohio, ahead. 
We have a Faculty Innovators Award program where we set aside $10,000 each year and we take nominations from faculty members, uh, from anybody who notices a faculty member that is putting digital content uh, into their coursework and uh, increasing student engagement. And we get probably 40 or 50 nominations annually and we select 10 uh, faculty members and give them each $1,000 a piece and uh, for uh, winning the Faculty Innovators Program. And that is a peer-to-peer -peer project that at least introduces faculty members to the importance of what their colleagues are doing to engage students through the use of something other than a traditional textbook. And we get some of the most creative ideas, and we get things that are being accepted by other states and other systems. Um, we have a pair of uh, faculty members that wrote an algebra book that is totally free. And that is being used in, in many states. And we're very proud to have had that originated under our faculty innovator program. Eric, uh, Andrew Feldstein, uh, just wanted to point out at Virginia State, I mean, this all actually did start with one faculty member. Um, you know, it, it starts with somebody starting a conversation. And, you know, when I began the conversation here, um, and you, got, you talked to more and more people, and, and it sort of got rolling um, and picked up momentum, and then the whole initiative came in place. But it was all because it started with a single conversation. But, but on an administrative side, um, while it begins with a faculty member, you, I often describe it as you also need to have the perfect storm uh, for it to be able to be materialized. Because as we all know, institutions have policies and procedures that need to be adhered to. And in our case here at Virginia State, were not for the fact that we had a very supportive administration who cleared the way for us to um, have an exception with the current contract with our book provider, we would not have been able to implement this initiative. So, so you really need to have a perfect storm. You need to have a, an incredibly supportive administration, both president and, and the provost here uh, were incredible. We need to have a faculty champion who thought the idea and, and embraced it and then translated it and, and shifted to the faculty body. You, the faculty itself, if you want to implement it in the entire school, in the entire university, you need to be embraced of 21st century technologies. And then obviously you need to have the students to be receptive to it. So yes, it starts with a faculty member, but then it's not just that easy. You've got to ensure that you're not stepping on anybody's toes or that there are no contracts in place that are going to um, prohibit you from launching this initiative. That's great. Thank you for all those answers. Kelly, uh, next question? I'd like to move to a couple of questions. Um, we've got a number of questions from uh, for Cable, if I could uh, go in that direction. Um, Cable, uh, there were several questions about what are Washington's plans to continue to incentivize open textbooks and revision in years to come given the changing nature of state budget constraints. And then separately, a separate question, um, can you talk a little bit more about the type of content that would be included in the courses? Will it be something more substantial than just PowerPoint and links, or would it also include more interesting things such as game-like content? Uh, sure. So, so how are we incentivizing? Uh, again, back to my sustainability point, um, we have moved uh, the use of and the funding of open educational resources into our core operations, um, mainly through my team and, and our budget. Um, but we have, uh, just, just to be clear about that, we have ongoing state funding, uh, which has been uh, specifically handed to us by our state legislature to continue open education efforts. Um, so, um, and, and that money, um, well, that money exists. So that's a positive thing. And, and any, any I, I realize funds are hard to come by, but one of the things that um, I think other presenters have said is that it's important to be able to make the case for why this is so important and to make it to the right people who can then support you when it comes time to get a particular policy in place or to get budgets uh, in place. Um, so what are, to, to the question, what are we doing to incentivize, to support? Um, best advice I've ever received was from uh, Martha Cantor and Hal Plotkin. Martha was the under, or, uh, is now the Under Secretary of Education at, at Department of Education. She was the Chancellor at Foothill De Anza, and uh, where they started the Community College 
Consortium for Open Educational Resources. And when I started learning about this field, I was talking with Martha, and she said that the biggest concern that faculty will ever have about this conversation is whether or not um, you will mandate the use of open educational resources um, and whether or not it will infringe on their academic freedom. And so, you know, ne never do it and always stay away from it at all costs and make sure nobody else ever goes there. And I said, great, that's not a problem. We don't, uh, you know, we don't mandate the use of technologies on our technology plan either, so it's not, not really what we do. We're all carrot and very little stick. Um, and then I said, well, what do you do to incent? And she said, well, it's very easy. What, what we have uh, control over at, in the administration and at the board level is, is money, essentially, and resources. And so she said, I simply stand up uh, in front of the faculty at Foothill Danza and the entire district, and she says to them things like, or said to them, things like, I know that open textbooks can be done, and I see that Intro to Statistics is our highest enrolled course. Who wants to solve the problem? And whoever does, uh, we will uh, provide you with uh, sabbatical time. We'll provide you with funding to produce um, said textbook. We will, um, you know, we'll do whatever it takes uh, to support you. There's no mandate to do it. Nobody has to be involved. If you don't like these ideas, don't play. But for those of you who want to, uh, we will um, we'll provide money and, and time. And so, uh, we're, so we're, our, that's our philosophy too. The Open Course Library Project was completely uh, optional. Those folks who had this interest to do this kind of work and contribute uh, were the ones that applied. Uh, and we provided them uh, essentially with release time uh, or stipends. They could take it any way they wanted to. Uh, we're, we are supporting these activities with faculty learning communities, so providing some, uh, some grant funds to faculty at colleges who want to experiment uh, with a new idea. Uh, we'll be putting out another round of grants for the second phase of our Open Course Library project coming up soon. And this fall, we'll be rolling out a round of incentive grants to adopt Carnegie Mellon Open Learning Initiative courses. And we haven't decided yet or not, but we may very well do some incentive uh, funding around uh, the Open Course Library curriculum as well. And you know, so the idea is uh, help, help folks move faster who want to move in a direction anyway. Uh, to the content question, it really varies by course, what's in the courses. Um, we do not have a strict template. Uh, for any of the courses. What we have are requirements to leverage uh, best practices that are in the field in instructional design and accessibility and technical interoperability and, and all those things to make them usable um, uh, on the back end. Uh, we are purposefully designing our courses very modularly, but, but what uh, the, the format of the courses, what content is in the courses, what, what the curriculum actually looks like, the exercises, the assessments, et cetera, is very much up to the design teams. So um, what I'd invite all of you to do is uh, come this uh, summer slash fall when we release these courses and connections, uh, take a look. Uh, they will be free. You'll be able to download them. And uh, if you find pieces that are useful, feel free to take them. If you want the whole course, it's all yours. Uh, if you want to make it better, that's what we hope you do is you download it, uh, make it better than what we've done, and you share it back. Uh, because that's how there was uh, also a question asked along the lines of making it better. How often will the co open content at Washington be updated? Do you want to address that as well? Sure. Um, so you know, part of the answer is uh, potentially continuously. So it, we're going to put our content out in connections, which is an open repository, uh, for two main reasons. One is that's where the action is. There's a critical mass of, of uh, people who are um, who use that repository. So we want to be where the traffic is for the same reason that you'd want to sell your car on Craigslist and not your local newspaper anymore because there's traffic there. Um, and the second reason is that Connections makes it easy for somebody else to uh, download uh, your work, uh, re-upload it as a new version, and they've got versioning control and, and, and persistent URLs um, taken care of. Um, so we hope, and we've talked with many states who are very interested in um, taking a look at the Open Course Library courses, potentially using them and changing them. Um, at least five states have told us uh, community colleges in five states. Uh, we are we are very eager to get our hands on this because we have a high percentage of adjunct faculty at our colleges, and there's fairly high turnover with those adjunct faculty. And when those folks come to our college today, they're given very little prep time and oftentimes a, a not a lot of materials uh, to get started. And we intend to use the Open Course Library courses to hand them a complete course and say to them. Here is a, an open course. If you don't like it, you can change it. If you really don't like it, you don't have to use it at all. But we're not starting you with nothing. Um, and if you want to do something else next quarter, knock yourself out. But at least 
uh, you're not starting from, from scratch. Um, we, we also, in our system, have approximately 75% adjunct faculty rates, about 25% full-time. And so it's a, that's a, a, an important use case. Um, our hope is that um, others will be able to use and modify. Um, it, another quick uh, story, we bumped into sailor.org. I don't know if you all have seen sailor yet, sailor foundation. But they are doing a very similar project uh, with some <laughs> similar courses as us, and we're actually on the phone with them right now saying, how can we work together as you move forward and as we move forward into phase two? And if you go to uh, their site, what you'll see is everything they've got is out uh, on a blog or a wiki, and it's out in the open, and you can copy and paste today. So we'll be working with them as we move forward. Great. Thank you, Cable. Um, I wanna, there's a bunch of questions I'd like to circle around um, and group together uh, that go back in uh, the area of quality and ensuring quality, um, whether it's of textbooks or of courses. Or one great question about, uh, you know, for flat world knowledge, uh, you know, where are these textbooks coming from? Are they just uh, books that were not chosen by other publishers? And the second is how can you ensure um, how can you ensure overall quality? That that's one of the hurdles that open educational resources or open textbooks have to face, and how can you address that. Um, well, this is Eric. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll address it for Flat World. I think you know part of the answer to that question is there, there is no single answer. I think that the way that open education resources or open textbooks are produced and um, and vetted and improved uh, and iterated upon is is really quite different. I think from um, person to person or group to group. I know from from our um, perspective, we set out to to, to actually um, build content, content textbooks just the way that the publishing industry does today. So uh, we consider ourselves a, a, a premium quality publisher, uh, no different than a Pearson or a McGraw-Hill. My, my co-founder was editor-in-chief at McGraw-Hill and editorial director at Pearson. So we're very focused on, first, uh, finding the best author uh, for a work. So we reject about 98, 99% of what comes our way. Uh, most of the books we publish are books we went out and sought uh, a top quality author for, um, assigned them to an exclusive contract to write that textbook. Uh, we peer review all of it extensively. We, we have editors. We have illustrators. Um, and so we're building textbooks that if you closed your eyes, ripped off the cover, and then flipped open the book and looked through it, um, we believe uh, well, more often than not, you'll say this is as good or better than uh, the book that I'm using today. Uh, we think if you don't produce high quality materials, uh, you're just not going to be on the playing field. So um, uh, the difference, of course, is in the way that we then turn around and publish them under an open license, give more control and versatility to users, give students lots more choices, and collect our money differently, uh, rather than uh, all of it in the first semester and watch it displaced by used books and, and shared books in the second and third and fourth semester increasingly. Uh, we choose to, to give it away for free and then uh, have students purchase things around that. And if you look at it, almost 60% purchase. And it's every semester 60% purchase. So although we make our money more slowly, by the end of four semesters of somebody using a flat world book in a course, we've generated uh, at the same amount of income in that course uh, as Pearson has generated, um, although they got most of theirs in the first semester. Uh, and we turn around and pay authors 20% of that relative to an industry average royalty rate of 12%. So when we pay our authors 20% on comparable revenue, our authors actually stand to make more income. And so we've, we've started with the premise that if we can't attract world-class authors um, and we can't pay them um, uh, well, then, um, then our particular flavor of a commercial model of open textbooks probably won't be sustainable in the long term. But that's our particular approach. There are many other approaches to that same issue, and I'll open it up for anyone else to address that question. So I want to actually thank you, Eric. There were a number of questions that were also being asked about author compensation models, so you delved into that a little bit as well. Um, but uh, do other people want to uh, add on to the issue of quality and open uh, educational resources? Yeah, this is, this is Cable. Real quick, uh, don't forget, we've got $20 billion a year we're spending on textbooks. We have more than enough money to produce the very best quality textbooks with all the supplemental materials and make them freely available to anybody who wants them. The, the public is already paying for that. We pay for it mainly through federal financial aid and state financial aid, and whatever that's not picking up is being picked up by student debt. And student debt in this country, student loan debt, has now surpassed both mortgage debt and credit card debt. We, the, the value proposition is all out of whack. Eric is absolutely right. And we need to stop 
we just need to stop playing by the old business rules and say we don't have to act like that anymore. But it requires those of us who are in positions where we can make policy changes, where we can work with legislatures, where we can work with budgets. And when I say all of us, I'm including faculty and librarians and presidents and chancellors and legislators and vendors and anybody else who's willing to go to bat for this particular topic. We can do things differently, and we can do them at the highest level of quality. It's a mistake if we let ourselves get pulled into conversations about you're doing that side little project over there. How are you going to sustain it? How are you going to pay for it? And how are you going to make sure that that one little project is going to produce the very best stuff? Because if you don't, it's garbage and nobody's going to use it. And I told you OER wouldn't work. That is a trap. And none of us should let ourselves get pulled into that. We need, we're having the right conversations now, but we need to have bigger conversations about what's possible given the new structure. Great. Um, perhaps a good point to uh, jump off to after that one is there were a number of questions about student outcomes. So for instance, um, you know, anything that people want to elaborate about student outcomes as well as uh, one question, particularly Cable, that was addressed to you about uh, what kind of funding would be available to the degree to which content starts to show uh, uh, results in terms of student success and student outcomes. But uh, let me just open that up to say if people want to reflect on that notion of student outcomes. And let me take a shot at that if I could. Um, mm -hmm. First off, one of the things that we're doing in Ohio is subsidy has always been delivered based on the third week of enrollment. The model that's being experimented with, in fact, is in its second year, is to, to award subsidy based on success points. And that isn't the third week enrollment, but it's the tenth week enrollment. And since affordability is one of the key of affordability, engagement, and preparedness are the three things that define student success more than anything else. You can change the institutional culture if the institution is rewarded for students able to get through to the end of the term and continue on their path towards completion. And as Eric suggested, making sure you're working with the highest quality authors, and as Cable suggested, to take advantage of the, of the resources available to invest in high quality resources all lead to a series of resources that can help the institution, as they support their instructor, bring their student uh, more successfully through the course. The, the two related points to that are, number one, all of the, many of the repositories in which the OER are deposited have rating systems. So you can look for um, peer review of that content to see whether or not it offers value. And, and the second thing, Part of our research with the flat world materials, all of our introductory courses have learning outcomes defined as the basis for transfer and articulation. So if a student begins their educational experiences at a community college and moved to a four-year, like Darlene was describing, Columbus State and Ohio State, the four-year school knows that the two-year student has been prepared along the same learning expectations as if they'd taken the course there. So we'll have data in terms of whether or not these resources are associated with the student's success on those learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. Could I also direct part of that question uh, directly to the folks at uh, Virginia State in terms of, uh, and I'm not sure, if, not sure if Andrew's still with us. I know he had to teach uh, at some point. Uh, but there were some questions about the VSU results and whether or not they've seen any linkage there to student outcomes at this point, or is it too early to tell, and is that part of the future study? Um, this is Mirta, and yes, Andrew had to go ahead and go on to teach class. I think what we've experienced, as I said earlier, though anecdotal has been uh, uh, has been in, in all by all means a success. Uh, the first semester that um, we launched um, the uh, textbooks, the digital textbooks, uh, as I said earlier, we did it with nine courses, and uh, anecdotally, we've had double-digit retention rates in these in these courses. Now, as Andrew suggested, um, just because the students are downloaded their, uh, their textbooks doesn't mean anything. It's whether or not they're actually reading the material. And what we're able to do now is track to ensure that they are indeed reading the materials and to what devices they're actually uh, downloaded the material to. So, uh, we have seen a, a tremendous rise in student interaction. They're, they're happy to be able to download the information, and they're reading it. 
um, and the numbers are being crunched so that we can put the empirical uh, information out, obviously, through the publications to support the anecdotal um, um, data that we have seen. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, we've had a really great number of questions, and there are a number of questions given the size of the audience that we've not been able to get to. Uh, there will be a survey that will come to people uh, within the next day. One of the options there is if you want some additional information, feel free to note that if you would like to have somebody follow up with you with some content or some additional questions that you may have that you may want to have answered. And we'll also capture as much as this and try and uh, answer any individual questions that we were not able to get to. But um, the last question that I think I would, uh, would pose in a couple of different ways, so I'll pose it to perhaps uh, to all the panelists that are, are still here, is, uh, you know, this is really great. Where else can I go for more information? Should I go to the Flat Roll Knowledge websites? Are there some good open educational resources sites that you want to promote to me? Uh, promote? Do you each want to take a moment and just uh, talk about uh, the specific places and resources or groups or collaborative communities that you value? Sure, I'll, I'll start. This is uh, Eric. I mean, I think uh, there, there's um, certainly uh, flatworldknowledge.com is a place where, where today you can find uh, a number of high-quality open textbooks under the model that I described. Uh, that's an easy one. Um, Connectionscnx.org uh, is the one that has been referenced a number of different times. Uh, that's a repository with, I don't know what the number is now, Cable, you may know, but probably uh, 18,000 or so uh, educational modules, all openly licensed and remixable. Um, Merlot, uh, M-E-R-L-O-T, that org at Cal State has a mix of open and, and non-openly licensed materials. And when you search by subject or discipline, you can also add the filter of, of whether you'd like an open license or not. Um, and there are some um, search engines like oercommons.org uh, where you can go and, and generally search for uh, subjects. Uh, and it will search across different open repositories. So, uh, those are some reasonably good starting places, and I'm sure others have uh, other things to contribute. Yes, Cable's been doing a great job uh, posting some links as well. Do you want to add, he's adding some Twitter links and the Open Course Library blog um, and other posts as well. Uh, Cable, anything verbally you want to add to that? We just grab those links. Oh, sorry. I was still typing. <laughs> there you go, I got him. And he's also put his, uh, uh, you can follow Cable certainly on uh, Twitter as well. He just posted that as well. Uh, yeah, I guess the advice I'd give, and this is part of the how does an institution start small and, and kind of dip a toe in the water, um, I would strongly recommend joining one of the open organizations and assigning one of your um, you know team members to participate, somebody who's got the bug and, and is excited about it. If you're a community college, join the Community College Consortia for Open Educational Resources. Just type in CCCOER into Google and it'll pop right up. Um, we're actually uh, merging that organization right now with the Open Courseware Consortium, so um, which is another good one to join. If you're interested in repositories and you want to join the Connections Consortium, that's another great uh, place to play. But I think what you'll find is once you show an interest in this broader concept of open educational resources and you are willing to learn and contribute and share, that you will be um, welcomed with open arms and they will uh, hug you and uh, and say thank you for joining and they will very quickly find out what you're interested in and there will be opportunities for you to, to contribute and fill gaps because there are a lot of gaps uh, of work that needs to be done. So if um, that's what I would recommend. Join an org and, and get in the conversations. We also have multiple listservs um, that you'll want to be on. If you're and they hit most of them, but if you want a warm hug, go down to the Florida, Florida Orange Grove is just one last suggestion. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. And Ed, Steve has also done a great job uh, organizing a NING group for the, well, I know we've had a lot of participants today uh, from Ohio, so uh, that's a community that is building uh, up in Ohio as well. Um, so with that, I think um, we appreciate everyone's time today and, and spending the time that you did, both listening to the presentations and also uh, the Q&A that follows. Um, we appreciate your time and uh, look forward to continuing the dialogue in other forums and other places. Uh, any final words, Eric, that you want to close with? No, I think i um, just thrilled to, to have the interest and uh, to see the uh, movement for, for open education continue to grow. Okay, thank you very much and have a good afternoon.